Superman is one of the few intrinsically American icons, which is ironic because he was co-created by a Canadian. From being adapted into films, TV, and video games to having thousands upon thousands of published comic book appearances, Superman's impact on pop culture can't be overstated. I'm Dave Baker, and today on Total Nerd, we're going to be explaining who Superman is, what brought about his creation, and who his co-creators actually were. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Total Nerd channel. Oh, and that's not enough. Leave a comment too and let us know what other Total Nerd topics you'd like to see us explain next. Jerome Jerry Siegel and his best friend and future collaborator Joe Schuster were both born in 1914. Siegel in Cleveland, Schuster in Toronto. Jerry's father was a sign painter and an immigrant from Russia. Schuster's a Dutch-Ukrainian tailor. The two future Comics Hall of Famers met in 1924 when they each attended Glenville High School in Cleveland. They were both avid science fiction fans, bonding over a shared love of the pulp magazines like Amazing Stories and Weird Tales. This shared love of storytelling drove them to seek work at the Glenville Torch, their local Cleveland newspaper. The two boys had a wild obsession with Edgar Rice Burroughs' iconic Tarzan Lord of the Apes. As such, their first published piece together was a Tarzan parody from 1931 titled Goober the Mighty. Like so many creators, the first version of their idea didn't quite turn out the way they'd hoped. After submitting to many science fiction and pulp magazines, the two boys decided to strike out on their own and self-publish a fanzine, self-titled Science Fiction. The first issue was published in October of 1932. However, it wouldn't be until the third issue in 1933 that the rough form of their now iconic character would first appear. In a story called Reign of the Superman, Siegel and Schuster create a narrative about a mad scientist who creates an ubermensch-esque, physically overpowered, eugenically created super soldier. This story has more to do with Frankenstein than what we currently imagine as Superman. It's dark, twisted, and deeply anxiety prone. So basically, exactly what Zack Snyder did. Huh. Good for you, Zack. At this point in the history of comics, most were distributed through the comic strip form. They were bought by a syndicate who had connections with numerous papers, and the creators were paid per paper that opted to carry their strip. However, by the mid-1930s, comic books were coming into fashion. Pulp publishers, who were looking for a way to diversify their publishing lines, took comic strips, packaged them together, and then sold them in book form. They proved to be very popular. In fact, the reason why many American comics are printed at 10.6 by 6.36 is because when you take a newspaper, and you fold it in half, and then you fold it in half again, those are the exact dimensions. Publishers are lazy. Seeing the rise in popularity of this format of comics, Siegel and Schuster decided to rebrand their Superman as a good guy and try their hand at the whole having it published in book form thing. They submitted to virtually every publisher. Only one was interested, a company named Consolidated. Siegel and Schuster were thrilled. They loved Consolidated's comic book, Detective Dan. Unfortunately, their joy was short-lived because money problems. Consolidated opted not to publish the new comic book sized Superman story of an inhumanly strong dude from another world because they ran out of money. The pair was so distraught that they destroyed the original pages. In fact, only one page from this story still exists. Thinking Superman was officially dead, Siegel and Schuster started branching out and pitching other ideas, some of which actually got published. Henry Duval of France, famed soldier of fortune, a pirate comic was published by New Fun No. 6. Slam Bradley, Dr. Occult, and Bart Reagan Spy were some of their other fare. Slam Bradley was their most successful creation to date, a comic about a two-fisted detective. It was steeped in hard-boiled crime traditions of the day, which is to be expected, I guess, because there aren't too many concert pianists named Slam. About this time, Jerry Siegel's father, who was working in a convenience store, was murdered in a robbery. He was shot repeatedly in the chest. The urban legend is that Siegel, in the throes of grief, found himself fantasizing about being bulletproof, which many historians have said is the reason he revisited the idea of Superman. However, this version of Superman would be the exact opposite of the previous ones. It would be hopeful and joyous. It would be about appealing to man's better nature. Not cynical and dark, it would be uplifting and place emphasis on how Americans always believe in doing the right thing. Inspired by their Jewish heritage, Superman's backstory would be derived from the biblical story of Moses. His visual aesthetic would be inspired by circus strongmen who often wore leotards for increased flexibility. Siegel was also very interested in the idea of projecting an air of nobility, and therefore suggested the cape. 
Siegel and Schuster got to work. They created an eight-page story for their newly revamped superhero and sent it around to the various publishers. National Publishing, run by Harry Donenfeld, who had previously worked with Siegel and Schuster on Slam Bradley, expressed interest. They were planning to launch a new comic that would appeal directly to boys, titled Action Comics. National saw an almost instant return on their Superman comics. They just didn't know it yet. It actually took them a little while to figure out why Action Comics was selling so well, which is why Superman doesn't appear on the covers to Action Comics 2 or 3. In the 30s, the way they would calculate sales for an individual comic is say print a million copies. They'd then send those to newsstands and then wait to see how many returns they'd got. Then they'd subtract that number from what they had printed and then, uh, you know, just consistently lose a lot of money because that's a terrible way to do business. Well, legend has it that Action Comics number one was the best selling national comic to date, and the readers quickly made sure that the publisher realized that Superman was the reason, and that they wanted more of him, and more superheroes in general. Because of Superman's wild success, National started contracting cartoonists and asking them for more caped characters, which is what they called them in the 1930s. The most successful of these follow ups was, of course, Batman. Batman is credited as being created by Bob Kane, but in reality, he was created by Bill Finger and an army of ghost artists. Jerry Robinson, Sheldon Moldoff, Lou Schwartz, the list goes on and on and on. Bob Kane's father, who also happened to be a lawyer, is the main reason that Bob Kane continued to get credit and also got a deal that was significantly better than everyone else in the field. Batman would launch in Detective Comics 27, and it would sell like gangbusters. In fact, it would sell so well that National would quickly rebrand DC Comics soon after. Harry Donenfeld, the owner and publisher of National, got started in the publishing business in the 20s when he and his brother bought a printing press and started operating under the name Martin Press. How did an immigrant salesman with ties to New York gangs have enough money to start publishing? Eh, who knows? However, it's been suggested that famed East Coast gangster Frank Costello partnered with Donenfeld in order to clean his Prohibition era rum running money. But our boy Donenfeld would never have done that. He was an upstanding citizen who definitely treated people he worked with with, you know, humanity and empathy and, you know, with respect, right? Well, he did buy the rights for Superman for $130, but it's fine. You know, it's fine. That was then. That was then. And yes, Frank Costello was Donenfeld's lifelong best friend. And yes, Jack Leibowitz, the national accountant and co-owner, cut Siegel and Schuster one check not for just the Superman payment, but for the payment for Slam Bradley and a bunch of other stuff they'd already done. So if they wanted the Superman money and therefore forking over the rights, they had to do the, basically, they just held him hostage. When Siegel and Schuster wanted to renegotiate their deal after the runaway success that was Superman, Donenfeld was like, yeah, sure, bros, you guys rock. Thanks for putting in so much hard work and, you know, basically single-handedly inventing the superhero genre. He offered to give them a slight raise and guarantee them a specific amount of work a year. That is basically the same as a totally not gangster, definitely not stealing all your rights for $130, right? Siegel and Schuster, believing they had no other option, accepted Donenfeld's offer and kept working on Superman, which would balloon, in success, to two titles, a radio adaptation, and a newspaper strip. During World War II, Siegel was drafted and served in Hawaii. Schuster was declared unfit for service because of his eyesight. While Siegel was away, Schuster kept drawing comics. Around this time, DC started publishing Superboy, a book that Siegel had pitched many times before. And been turned down for. When he returned from the war, Siegel sued DC because it wasn't in their initial contract. They had the rights to Superman, not Superboy. Schuster, however, did not want to be involved in the lawsuit because he was concerned about losing his job drawing for DC. This caused a rift between the two men's friendship that they never quite recovered from. Ultimately, Siegel settled with DC, giving them the full copyrights to Superman and Superboy in exchange for $94,000, which is around a million dollars when adjusted for inflation. In Siegel's 1948 divorce paperwork, it's listed that after his exorbitant legal fees, he was only left with $29,000. After quitting DC, Siegel and Schuster would reteam to create the character of Funny Man for Magazine Enterprises. The series lasted six issues before it was canceled. This would be the last time the two would collaborate on comics together. Marketed as the first Jewish superhero, Funny Man stars Larry Davis, a TV comedian who's convinced by his manager to take on superhero exploits as a publicity stunt. However, in a random happenstance, Funny Man ends up actually stopping actual criminals and then decides to take up a life of a comic crime buster. Needless to say, he uses practical joke-themed gadgets and impractically large clown shoes to make the world safer, I guess? It's about as good as it sounds. 
In a metatextual twist though, Siegel vented some of his anger at Superman copycat characters like Marvel Man and Captain Marvel by having a running narrative with two imitator characters, Laugh Man and Comic Man, showing up and attempting to drive Funny Man out of business. Very subtle. After Funny Man failed to take off, Joe Shuster started working on some rather racy publications, chief among them Knights of Horror, where he would draw BDSM comics and illustrations. These drawings are taboo by 2019 standards. When you look at them with 1950s eyes, well, they're probably not what would be considered high art. At the prompting of his new wife, Siegel returned to work at DC. He wrote some Superman during this time period, but mostly worked on the much beloved Legion of Superheroes. He co-created one of the greatest characters in the history of the Legion, for Christ's sake, Matter Eater Lad, whose powers are he eats matter. However, in 1966, Jerry Siegel was let go from DC. Why? Well, because Siegel and Schuster were planning another lawsuit, and this time, they were going for all the marbles. They approached DC's golden boy, Bob Kane. Kane listened to what they had to say, and he said he needed a day to think about it. He then immediately went to DC and told them that he wanted to renegotiate his contract for Batman for a larger stake in ownership. And if they didn't want to renegotiate, he'd go join Siegel and Schuster's lawsuit. So, you know, he screwed them over. There's just more evidence that Bob Kane sucks. When the release of Superman the Motion Picture was announced, Jerry Siegel was ill and had fallen on hard times again. He was not given any financial remuneration due to the project, and after lobbying for an extended period of time for compensation, he put out a press release which gained widespread attention. Siegel didn't mince words with the title of his screed, A Curse on the Superman Movie, with passages like, Joe is partially blind and in not good health. We're both 61 years old. Most of our lives during Superman's great success have been spent in want. It's easy to see why the public was won over to Siegel and Schuster's side. Thanks in part to the effort of many cartoonists, chief among them Neil Adams, DC and Siegel and Schuster reached a settlement. They would be awarded a lifetime contract that would pay them each $20,000 a year. This would later be upped to $30,000 a year. Joe Schuster died on July 30th, 1992 in West Los Angeles of congestive heart failure. He was ostensibly blind, struggling with eye issues for most of his adult life. He was 78 years old. Just four years later, on January 26th, 1996, Jerry Siegel would pass away from a heart attack. The two men had been widely credited with establishing many of the tropes associated with the superhero genre. They had wide-ranging careers writing and drawing comics. Were they as utilized as they could have been? No. Were they fairly compensated? No. However, they created one of the most iconic and totemic pieces of culture the world has ever seen. They're responsible for inspiring legions of people to want to do better. And they turned armies of young people into comic book fans and readers. Well, what do you think? Did Siegel and Schuster get a fair shake? Will we as a nation ever get over CG demustached Superman? Will we even get a good Superman movie again? At this point, now that the Mad Max lawsuit's over, I'm hoping we finally get that Man of Steel 2 with George Miller directing, baby! Remember that rumor? God, it feels like a million years ago. If you like this video, please comment below and let us know what other areas of nerd culture you think needs an explainer. In the meantime, like, comment, and subscribe for more Total Nerd videos.